الحمد للإله سابغ النعم وخالق الإنسان من بعد العدم فالحمد ثم الحمد ثم الحمد لك حمدا كثيرا طيبا يا رب لك أعطيتنا خيرا كثيرا ربنا سترت عن كل الورى عيوبنا ثم الصلاة بعد والتسليم على النبي المصطفى الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. So in our last uh, lesson, uh, I had done the story of Tufail ibn Amr al-Dawsi, who was the chieftain of the tribe of Dos, and with that story we began the story of Abu Huraira رضي الله تعالى عن. He was the one who gave da'wah to the tribe of Dos. The Prophet has made du'a for the people of Dos, and. Uh, one of the people, so we can say that the Islam of Abu Huraira was actually one of the results of the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Oh Allah, guide the tribe of Dos. So from that dua, one particular person became the most famous person, much more famous than Tufayl who actually began the da'wah. And again, this goes back to so many talks I've been giving about uh, the reality of one person doing a good deed and its effects are so much that in fact, some of those good deeds even eclipse the initial good deed. So we talked about Abu Hurairah radiallahu an and his name and his early Islam uh, and the fact that he was from the people of as Sufa. And I had mentioned quite a lot about the people of as Sufa as much as last week allowed. And also I refer you back to the story of the Sufa back in the Seerah, and I spoke about the people of Sufa uh, in the Seerah. So today, inshallah, we'll finish off the story of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So the first question that we ask ourselves is how long did he spend with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How long was his uh, journey with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Well, he arrived in the month of Safar in the seventh year of the Hijrah. And the Prophet ﷺ passed away in the 11th year of the Hijrah uh, in Rabi' al-Awwal. So essentially, that is the 8th, 9th, 10th, and then 11th. So essentially, a little less than four years. However, in those four years, Abu Huraira left Medina for short periods of time. We don't know exactly how long, uh, but for one period of time, the Prophet ﷺ sent him to the province of Bahrain to basically collect the zakah and do some administrative work in the lands of Bahrain. So pause here, Bahrain was not the island Bahrain that we call the Bahrain. Bahrain also was Dahran, Dammam, that was also called Bahrain. That entire province was called uh, Bahrain at that time. Uh, and it was the province that was next to the Persian Empire. Uh, and so... Abu Huraira was sent as an emissary uh, on behalf of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And by the way, this shows us the trust that he occupied. In that, barely a year after he came, the Prophet Sallallahu sent him on something of great importance and value. And this is enough to indicate the trust that the Prophet Sallallahu had for him. How long was he in Bahrain? We do not know exactly. However, it would not have been more than a few months given that he came back and participated in other expeditions. And that is why he himself underestimated his time. And he said, and the hadith is in Bukhari, Sahibtu Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thalatha sinin. I accompanied the Prophet sallallahu for three years of my life. So he said three years. When you go back and look, he is conservatively underestimating. In fact, it is three years and some months. But he is being modest here and he's bringing it down. But he himself said, I accompanied the Prophet ﷺ for three years. And I was never as anxious to memorize hadith as I was during those three years. In the Mustad ibn Muhammad, different version, same wording, but slightly different. I accompanied the Prophet ﷺ for three years. And the only thing that kept me busy in those three years was hifz of the Prophet ﷺ's hadith. So he himself tells us those three years of his life, he did not have any occupation, any job, any responsibility other than to live in the masjid morning to evening, to sleep in the masjid, to accompany the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And that is why in the Sunan of Ad-Darimi, he himself said, I do not know of any sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam who learned his hadith better than I did. So he himself is saying, I don't know anybody who was more eager during those three years than, than uh, anyone other than myself. 
And in fact, Ibn Kathir in his history, he even reports that the Prophet ﷺ offered him uh, some money so that he could go buy something, or he could go and start a business or something. And the Prophet ﷺ offered him some of the ghanima came from some uh, expedition and he offered it as an investment for Abu Huraira. And Abu Huraira responded that, I only want Ya Rasulullah that and to allimani mimma allamak Allah. That you teach me what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught you. That's the only thing I want. I don't want any, I don't want to be preoccupied by any investment, any property, anything. And of course, we will learn that eventually after the death of the Prophet, Sama Abu Huraira lived a decent life. He became a businessman. So this shows us he wasn't a Staghfirullah, a lazy person. He wasn't a person who's basically living off the system, not that the system had much to offer. He was not lazy. He was not unintelligent. He was a smart person who eventually made a decent income for himself, but he only did that after uh, leaving, or sorry, after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left this world, that is when he entered into the business and buying and selling. Otherwise, before that, he dedicated his life to the hadith. And this is what makes him unique, as we will say over and over again. I said it last week, and I'll say it again today. We don't know of any other companion like this. The amount of dedication to cut off from this dunya, to not get married during those three years, to not have a house that he's living in, in the beginning, we'll get to the fact maybe he had a house later on, Allah knows best. But definitely in the beginning, he didn't even have a house that he lived in. That level of dedication is unknown from any other companion uh, except for Abu Huraira. And the enthusiasm that Abu Huraira has is preserved in various traditions. We get that indication in various traditions. For example, hadith is in Bukhari that... The famous hadith that Abu Huraira said, Ya Rasulullah, may my parents be given in ransom for you. This is how they would address the Prophet ﷺ, Fidaka Abi wa Ummi. You should all know this, it is a beautiful phrase. This is how they would address the Prophet ﷺ, Fidaka Abi wa Ummi. I will give my mother and father for you, Ya Rasulullah. It's easy to give yourself, it's much more difficult to give your loved ones. Fidaka Abi wa Ummi, Ya Rasulullah. What do you say? Between the takbira, Allahu Akbar, and qiraat al-fatiha, that silence, what do you say? And the fact that Abu Huraira is asking this question indicates how closely he is monitoring the actions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Look at the detail. Ya Rasulullah, what do you say? You're quiet during that time. I want to know what you say. Hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. The fact that Abu Huraira is asking this question is an indication of how much he is paying attention to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another hadith in Sahih Muslim. And again, look at the, these, these are a hadith you have all heard of, but now we learn Abu Huraira's narrating and see what the Prophet Sallallahu says. In another hadith, the, uh, Abu Huraira says, Ya Rasulullah, من أحق الناس بشفاعتك يوم القيامة. Who will have the greatest chance of your shafa'a on Judgment Day? Who will have the greatest chance of your shafa'a on Judgment Day? Hadith is in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet said, "O Abu Huraira, I assumed that no one would ask me this question before you because of your eagerness of hadith." Then he went on to answer the question. But there's that phrase right there. And this phrase is a testimony to Abu Huraira. I thought nobody would ask me other than you. I, this question, this deep question, who will gain your shafa'a the most on judgment day? I thought you would be the one to ask me. No one would ask me other than you because of your eagerness for the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And by the way, what is the hadith? Who knows? Who has the most chance of shafa'a of the Prophet on judgment day? I have done this hadith in other lectures. Who has no the criterion, not the person? The criterion. Not this hadith. These are all other hadiths. These people will get the shafa'ah. I agree. There are other hadith who will get the shafa'ah. Agree. But this is a special, different hadith. Man ahaqqu nas Who has the most right to your shafa'ah, ya Rasulullah? So the Prophet Sallallahu said, Man qala la ilaha illallah khalisan min qalbihi. It's a beautiful hadith and it gives all of us hope. Whoever says la ilaha illallah with ikhlas from his heart. 
that person has the utmost right for shafa'ah for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And there are a number of times as well throughout the hadith literature that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam assigned Abu Huraira to do a task or a chore. He gave him a responsibility. And not every Sahabi was given a responsibility, especially a public responsibility. And we believe that any time a companion is given a responsibility, this is a clear indication of what? Trust. And it is impossible that this trust will then be betrayed later on. And there are many examples of this. Of them is the hadith that uh, the Prophet told Abu Huraira that, oh, oh, oh Abu Huraira, go tell the people that whoever says La ilaha illallah without associating partners will enter Jannah. So go tell the people this. Also, we have the, uh, the, the position given. We don't know exactly what it was. Was it to collect the zakah? Was it to administer? The details are vague. But the Prophet sent Abu Huraira to Bahrain as an administrator. Now, what type of administrator? We don't know. In all likelihood, most likely it was to. Uh, be in charge of one tribe to collect their zakah and come back. So that is a political delegation. And that requires amana, and it requires a level of maturity, and it requires basically, essentially, Abu Hurairah is becoming like the ambassador, the envoy of the Prophet to that group of people, doing whatever needs to be done, then coming back. That is a very high honor, and it indicates that in a very short period of time, Abu Hurairah established his credentials in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And one of the most um, uh, significant tasks assigned to Abu Hurairah in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu in the ninth year of the Hijrah, when Abu Bakr was sent to perform the Hajj, remember the Prophet only performed one Hajj and that is in the 10th year, right? In the 9th year was the only time in Islamic, in human history, when something happened during Hajj. The 9th year of the Hijr is the only time when, what was unique about the 9th year, the 9th Hajj, the, ninth, the Hajj of the 9th year Hijrah, what was unique? That we do that every year. That's not unique. Mushrikine Mecca. Mushrikine Al Arab. Not Mushrikine Mecca. Close enough. I'll give it to you. I'll give you the prize. The only year in Islam, not Islam, in human history where Muslims and pagans performed Hajj together. Because the conquest took place when? The conquest of Mecca. Guys, come on. Eighth year of the Hijrah. Do you know how many messages I have to give you anyway? SubhanAllah. And by the way, I've already been asked that you come with me as well. So that's already been given. Somebody, somebody said, bring him with you. I said, I can't. He's like, to him. Okay, so. Literally, three days ago, somebody said, bring the note taker with you. I said, I can't. I'll talk to him. Anyway. Well, okay. Raise a GoFundMe page, yeah. <laughs> get a or get a new note taker now, huh? <laughs> no, there's only one and only. He's saying he's the one and only. Okay, alhamdulillah, khair. Uh, literally, wherever I go, he's infamous, and nobody knows who he is except you guys. So it's a secret. You have to keep it, by the way, huh? In South Africa and in India, wherever I go, they give salam to the note taker, but nobody knows who he is. So it's a secret. You guys cannot tell it to anybody. Okay, so, uh, and I keep on making fun of our dear respected note taker, and that's what they say, you tease him too much. I say, but you don't know how friendly I am with him, that's why, okay? You make fun of those who you are friendly with. Anyway, alhamdulillah. Um, what was I saying? Eighth year, jazakallah khair, Mr. Note Taker. The eighth year, he, re he regains himself. The eighth year was the conquest of Mecca. The ninth year was when the mushrikun and the Muslims performed hajj together. Now remember, the... Quraysh had accepted Islam outwardly by the eighth year. There were no pagans in Mecca. But there were pagans in the rest of Arabia. There were pagans in the north and the south and the farther east and west. They were mushrikun. And Islam was slowly conquering. That was the year of delegations. And by the 10th, 11th year, Islam had spread shakily. And that's why when the Prophet had passed away, the wars of Riddha started. They said, okay, khalas, it's a fad. We're going to leave now, right? So the ninth year, both of them did uh, Hajj and, and, and Umrah uh, together. Now in that year, even though there were Muslims uh, and pagans, in that year, there were no idols allowed to be brought. And that was when the announcement was made as well. 
and Abu Hurairah made the announcement. Abu Hurairah made the announcement. He went around Mina and around the Mutawafin and around the whole Hujjaj. That was his responsibility. And this is a very big honor. That what was the, what was the uh, announcement? That after this year, no mushrik is allowed to come to Mecca. You're not allowed to come after this year. And even in this year, no one shall perform the tawaf aryan or without clothes because that was their jahili custom that they felt that. You know, just subhanAllah, wallahi, the same philosophy in this modern nudist movement. The same thing. This is how God created us. This is our natural state. This is what we should do. The same philosophy. And that was what the Quraysh were saying. That why should we hide ourselves from Allah? You know, and this is not Allah Azza wa Jal. Yes, you came out this way, but Allah says we sent down Adam clothed. We didn't send down Adam without anything, right? So the point is that Abu Huraira was the one delegated to make this announcement and he represented the religion of Islam, the Prophet ﷺ going around every camp and every tribe and every place of Mina and Arafat and saying, no one shall perform Hajj after this year who is a mushrik and no one shall do tawaf in the state of Uri, in the state of uh, nakedness that has been prohibited. So this was again tasked with uh, Abu Hurairah. Along with him being with the Prophet ﷺ, from the ahadith that he narrated, we know that he accompanied him during every expedition that took place in those three and a half years, including the conquest of Mecca and the incident of Hunayn and the siege of at Ta'if and the march to Tabuk and the expedition of Mu'ta. He was a part of all of these expeditions. So he is of the Mujahideen of the Sahaba and not just somebody who took notes and writing. He was somebody who participated in Ghazawat and he fought in the battle and he wore armor and he has narrations in the books regarding his exploits on the battlefield as well. But of course, his main task and this is what Allah had assigned to him, was to memorize the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Later on in his life, he told one of his students, I used to divide my night into three. One part of the night was for salah, one part was for sleep, and one part was mudhakara of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. And mudhakara means to refresh my memory, to, to regurgitate and memorize the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So he had a healthy dosage of personal ibadah and he had a healthy dosage of ilm. And that was again unique for Abu Hurairah to get to that level of hadith. And in fact, it was narrated that even in his own lifetime, people began to be amazed at how many hadith he's narrating compared to the other companions. And this is something that we're going to come to right now. We're going to begin with this now. That when did the criticism of Abu Hurairah begin? In his own lifetime. But in his own lifetime, the criticism was extremely mild. We can't even call it criticism. We will call it questioning. And that questioning was answered by Abu Hurairah and it was silenced. So in Abu Hurairah's lifetime, you know, people talked, as they say, people talked. And they spoke about the quantity of narrations of Abu Hurairah, and he responded to those allegations, as we will mention right now. And that small talk mushroomed into more criticism as time went on, until later on, it is a full-on onslaught against Abu Hurairah, as again we will talk about. So one of the things that we learn is that when this talk increased, the governor of Medina at the time and eventually the Umayyad Khalifa, eventually Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Marwan was the cousin of Uthman, remember, right? Uthman and Marwan were first cousins, remember? And Marwan was the private secretary of Uthman and then eventually he becomes the founder, really. The Umayyad dynasty in reality is the Marwanid dynasty, right? It was only Muawiyah, Abu Sufyan, basically, uh, and then uh, Yazid, and then his son Muawiyah, literally for 40-something uh, years, that's it. Then it went to Marwan, and every single Khalifa up until the end of the Umayyads in Spain was from the descendants of Marwan, not from the descendants of Muawiyah and Abu Sufyan, right? Because uh, Marwan is going back to Abu Sufyan's generation and basically the cousin of Abu Sufyan and going all the way down there. So... Marwan ibn al-Hakam, when Muawiyah was alive, Marwan was the governor of Medina. Okay? And Abu Huraira was in Medina at the time. And this is now, we're talking about around 50 Hijrah. 
around 50 or so hijrah. So Abu Huraira is an elderly man. And people are talking that Abu Huraira has the largest halaqa at the time and people are coming all over to take notes. So Marwan wanted to test him. So he set up an exam for Abu Huraira. And this is one of the first recorded examinations of the narrators of hadith. Later on, this would become common, but very few people did it to the Sahaba. Later on, it will become very common. In the third generation, in the fourth generation, this is what everybody does to everybody. Imam al-Bukhari quizzed his own teachers. His teacher's generation quizzed his own teachers. That was common at that generation. At the level of the Sahaba, it was very rare. It was one of the first times we hear this. Marwan ibn al-Hakam was the governor of Medina, and he called Abu Huraira to his residence, and he had his scribe, his secretary, sit behind a closed door, a curtain, and he asked him a series of hadith from his memory. And the scribe wrote all of these hadith down. Then he let many months go by, some reversions say a whole year go by. Then he called Abu Huraira again. And he just pretended as if he had forgotten those. He asked the same questions. And the scribe was asked to dictate and write down what Abu Huraira is saying. And again, Abu Huraira didn't know that there's a scribe. And by the way, Abu Huraira did not write down his hadith. It was from memory. All of his hadith were from memory. Okay, So the scribe was behind the door and he ended up not having to write anything because everything Abu Huraira said was exactly as he has said it the last year. Word for word, letter for letter, nothing had changed. And so this was one of those explicit tests done to indicate that Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an had memorized a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And therefore his reputation as being one of the primary memorizers of hadith was already well known even in the early Sahaba's time, even Abu Bakr and Umar's time. And this is proven again in a hadith in Bukhari. And again, these are hadith we've all heard, but now we kind of skip over what is mentioned about Abu Huraira. We get to the gist of the hadith. Now we need to pause and get to what is being said about Abu Huraira. Hassan ibn Thabit. We, we, I mentioned this narration when I did Hassan's uh, story last year, I guess. Hassan ibn Thabit was reciting poetry in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar comes in and basically knocks him with his stick and says, how dare you recite poetry in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Hassan became angry and said, I used to recite poetry right here in front of somebody who was far better than you. Meaning? The Prophet ﷺ. Then he turned to Abu Huraira out of all of the Sahaba. He turned to Abu Huraira and he said, Anshuduka billah, I ask you by Allah, Ya Abu Huraira, did you not hear the Prophet ﷺ say to me, O oh Allah, help him with the Holy Spirit, with the Ruh al Qudus? And Abu Huraira said, Yes, I heard him say that. Now, this hadith I mentioned when we did, when we did Hassan ibn Thabit. What is of interest here, Hassan pinpoints one Sahabi. See, even in the generation of Umar ibn al-Khattab, if you needed a reference, you know who to go to. See, that's what I'm trying to get to. That the one person, even amongst the Sahaba, you're going to go to him, is going to be Abu Huraira. He turns and he, he's the one who says, I'm asking you, Abu Huraira, did you not hear the Prophet ﷺ say? And what does that indicate about the reputation of Abu Huraira, that already what level that he has uh, reached? And it is true that, as we said, there was some talk. And sometimes that talk came from senior Sahaba. And again, we need to understand and contextualize that Indeed, imagine you are some of the senior Sahaba, you've been with the Prophet ﷺ for 20 years, right? Then Abu Huraira comes along three years, and now he's narrating all of these hadith. You just wonder what's going on. So these narrations exist. Whenever you come across such a narration that is meant to denigrate Abu Huraira, never accept it without looking at the narration in its original book. Because what these groups do, they take half of it and they ignore the other half. And there is not a single narration in which this type of talk exists except that the end of the incident explains the beginning of the incident, okay? The problem comes that those that are critical, they only want to quote you half of the story. And they don't want to quote you the other half of the story. So yes, it does happen. And I'll mention some of them so that you are aware. So Umar ibn al-Khattab himself, once he... Uh, saw Abu Huraira's halaqa growing in the masjid. And this shows us Abu Huraira had a halaqa from the earliest of time. 
Eventually, it will become the biggest halaqa in the Prophet's masjid. Eventually, many years later. In Umar's time, he already has a halaqa. And Abu Huraira was giving his halaqa, and Umar ibn al-Khattab said, you had better stop narrating a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ, or else I will send you back to your land of a dose. I will send you back to your land of a dose. Now, this narration is true, that that did happen. However, when you look at the time frame and other narrations, at that time frame, Umar ibn al-Khattab had prohibited any halaqa of hadith because he wanted the people to memorize Qur'an. In the early part of Islam, he didn't want any hadith written down along with Qur'an. He wanted the Qur'an to be preserved. So he only had halaqat of Qur'an, and then later on in his life, he then allowed halaqat of hadith. If you remember, the Qur'an itself, there was the issue, the danger in the late Umar, uh, Abu Bakr period, early Umar period, people are dying, the hufad of the Qur'an, and uh, the Umar was worried, it was his uh, idea, as you know, to gather the Qur'an in one uh, one place. And so he wanted to preserve the Qur'an. And we know that later on, he allowed the, the halaqas of hadith because once he invited uh, Abu Huraira to uh, his gathering after he was giving other hadith, and he said, I want to ask you a question. Were you not with us on such and such a day when we visited the house of this person with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Abu Huraira said, yes, I was. And I know exactly why you're asking me this question. Umar said, why? Abu Huraira said, because it was on that day that we heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, Whoever lies about me intentionally, let him prepare for his place in the fire of hell. And so Umar said, if that is the case, then go ahead and narrate hadith. Okay. In other words, Umar ibn al-Khattab, when he heard that Abu Rayr had started the halaqa again, now he called him. And he wanted to make sure that Umar's standards are high. So he was going to quote him the hadith that they had heard, both of them, in a particular house. So he said, were you not there that day? And Abu Huraira said, I was there and I know exactly what you're asking. You want us to remember that hadith and I remember the hadith, don't worry. So then once Abu Huraira narrated that hadith, Umar ibn Khattab said, okay, as for now, I'm satisfied, go. So he allowed him to the narrate hadith. And this is a very clear narration that what was Umar's fear? It wasn't that he doubted Abu Huraira. He was just wanting to verify, Abu Hurairah, you sure we, are, we, are, we have a high standard here? And you have to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once Abu Hurairah said, I know Ya, I know, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, that whoever lies will go to Jahannam. I was there, you were there. So once Umar heard this and he was content, he said, okay then, go and do your halaqa. So he then allowed Abu Hurairah to have the halaqa uh, in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also, one of the famous narrations of criticism uh, was the one that once Abu Huraira visited our mother Aisha in her house behind the curtain. And Aisha radiallahu anha said, Oh Abu Huraira, you are narrating many hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Akhtarta. You are narrating so many ahadith. So Abu Huraira said, Wallahi ya ummah, wallah, oh my dear mother, ya ummah, oh our mother, that neither the mirror nor the duhun, uh, you know, the, the kuhul or the duhun, would prevent me from listening to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, meaning that, my dear mother, you were a wife and you had responsibilities and duties as a wife. As for me, I was sitting morning and evening only listening to hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Aisha then said, La'allahu, perhaps that is the case. La'allahu, perhaps that is the case. So again, we have Aisha herself, and she is the wife, and she knows Abu Hurair is narrating so many ahadith, so she's saying that, we, I have heard that you're narrating so many ahadith. And again, it's an amazement that is understandable from Aisha. And Abu Huraira makes his excuse, and he said, Oh my dear mother, you were busy in your wifely duties, I had no responsibility other than hadith. So then Aisha said, perhaps indeed that is the case. And Ibn Umar as well, uh, 
mentioned this, uh, the, the incident of, uh, there's a famous incident between Ibn Umar and uh, Abu Huraira uh, radiallahu ta'ala an. And Abu Huraira once, uh, there was a question about the blessings of Janazah. And Ibn Umar, it is as if he didn't know of any blessing of saying the Janazah prayer. And so Abu Huraira said, no, there is a great blessing in the Janazah prayer. I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam say, whoever witnesses a janazah and prays over it shall have one mountain of good deeds. Then whoever follows the janazah and witnesses the burial shall have two mountains of good deed. Each mountain is like the mountain of Uhud. So Ibn Umar got irritated now. Like Ibn Umar didn't know. And he's basically saying, there's no big blessing, just pray. And he, Abu Huraira is saying, no, there is a blessing. Ibn Umar said, Abu Huraira, you're narrating too much. This enraged Abu Huraira. And he went to Aisha immediately. And he said, oh, Ummah, oh, my dear mother, did you not hear the Prophet say this? And Aisha said, yes. Then he went back to Ibn Umar and said, Aisha also heard it. And Ibn Umar said, if that is the case, then indeed you were the one who stuck with the Prophet more than us and you are more knowledgeable of his hadith than us. This hadith is in Bukhari. This hadith is in Bukhari. Ibn Umar is shocked. I never heard this hadith. So he said, Abu Huraira, you're narrating too much. Where did you get this from basically? Right? And of course, Abu Huraira is now obviously... Yani, and again, see, here's the point. There's no accusation of lying, astaghfirullah. But the Sahaba are worried, look, you're, you're a human being. Are you sure you're not mixing things up? This is human error. And of course, Abu Huraira is going to be insulted at that. So he verifies it from Aisha. And then Ibn Umar admits, if that is the case, kunta alzamuna li rasulillah. You were more with the Prophet ﷺ than us. You accompanied him more than us. Now who is saying this? Ibn Umar, who knows the Prophet ﷺ from the days of Mecca. He's the one saying this. Ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Umar, the one who was uh, born in Mecca, migrated you know, to Medina, grew up with the Prophet ﷺ, you know, somebody who has been with him since his entire life. And he says, you were with the Prophet ﷺ more than us. And so you memorize his hadith better than us and the criticisms against Abu Huraira also irritated Abu Huraira and therefore ironically amazingly we have his own defenses in his own words his reputation was being smeared in his own lifetime by especially the people who because Abu Huraira was a defender of Uthman ibn Affan and in fact he guarded his house as we're going to come to and so the riffraff uh, were of the first group to really denigrate Abu Huraira, you know. Uh, anything before this is just, like we said, Aish and Ibn Umar, this is just minor stuff. But that group were the first to really start accusing Abu Huraira of astaghfirullah lying or something that no other sahabi would accuse any sahabi of. And so they were the ones who first give these, these evil rumors. And he was obviously very hurt at this. Who wouldn't be? And he was very irritated at this. And we have his reports in his own defense. And he says that... You people say that Abu Huraira narrates too many ahadith that the Muhajirun and the Ansar do not narrate. You people say Abu Huraira is narrating what the Muhajirun and Ansar are not narrating. But let me tell you, my brothers of the Muhajirun, they were busy in the buying and selling that took place in the marketplace. And my brothers of the Ansar, they were busy in the agriculture and the land that they owned. And as for me, I was a miskeen from the masakeen of the people of Sufa. And I would stick with the Prophet Sallallahu despite the hunger in my stomach. So I would be there when they were not. And I would memorize when they could not. And one day, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said something that whoever spreads out his thawb and then brings it forth, that will whoever does this will memorize what I say. So I was the first, I'm going to get to this, by the way, this is, I'm just doing a summary, I'm going to give a longer one now. So I was the first to spread my thawb out and then I 
put it back on me and ever since then I never forgot any hadith I heard from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now this hadith we're going to come to in a while and that is one of the uh, most important hadith which is an explicit hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made a special dua for Abu Hurairah. And there are other hadith as well about Abu Hurairah uh, in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim with a slight weakness. That one, The one that I just said to you is authentic. This one is slightly weak. Uh, uh, there's a missing chain from the Tabi'un which has a very slight weakness. It's a very trivial weakness, but it is still a weak hadith. That the Prophet ﷺ said, Abu Hurairah is a ocean of knowledge or maybe a proper translation, uh, is a container of knowledge. Okay? Abu Huraira is a container of knowledge. And he himself says, Abu Huraira, that were it not for two verses from the Quran, I would not have narrated one hadith to you. And then he quoted Surah Al Baqarah. Those who conceal the truth after it has been revealed to them then they are the people whom Allah has cursed and the cursors will curse. So Allah is saying those who conceal the truth are cursed. Abu Huraira felt, if I don't narrate hadith, I will be cursed. So I must narrate hadith uh, to you. And that is why Abu Huraira's halaqa, as we said, became the largest halaqa in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he had of the greatest number of students amongst the Tabi'een. Some of the greatest names of the Tabi'oon are his own students. Muhammad ibn Sirin. Ibn Sirin is one of the most famous of the Tabi'oon. Not only is he a student of Abu Huraira, he is a son-in-law of Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira's daughter is married to Muhammad ibn Sirin. Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab or Musayyib, both are allowed. Hammam ibn Munabbih, these are of the greatest of the narrators of the Tabi'oon. They are all the immediate students of Abu Huraira. Now, how many ahadith did Abu Huraira uh, narrate? It's difficult to verify, but suffice to say that in any list about the top narrators of hadith, number one is Abu Huraira. That's the whole point of the attack on Abu Huraira. In any list by any scholar in Islamic history, who has the most number of a hadith? Abu Huraira. And he has them by a head and shoulders, like quite a number. It's not like they're close by. It is Abu Huraira number one, then two, three, four, five are kind of sort of similar in the same ballpark figure. Okay? Abu Huraira has the most. How many does he have? Well, the largest book of hadith ever written in early Islam, and unfortunately, to this day, it is lost. It was written by a scholar in Andalus. He traveled the whole Muslim world, and he gathered the largest book of hadith. It is called the Musnad of Baqi ibn Makhlad. And Musnad of Baqi ibn, Baqi ibn Makhlad was a contemporary of Imam Ahmad. So he's the same time from Imam Ahmad, but he is from Andalus. And because he was from Andalus, so... Uh, that region, some of his books were preserved, some of his books were lost because of what happened in Andalus. And the Musnad of Baqi ibn Makhlad, we still do not have a single copy of it. We have references in many medieval books, but it was simply too large. And when you have too large of a book, to copy it becomes difficult. Allah knows what happens. There's still always hope to discover, but that was never discovered. But we do have a detailed discussion about the Musnad of Baqi ibn Makhlad and one of the things that is mentioned that 5,400 hadith of Abu Huraira are in that Musnad 5,400 something now the next group of Sahaba have around 2,000 or 3,000 a hadith such as Aisha such as Ibn Umar such as Anas ibn Malik such as Jabir ibn Abdullah these are the next names and all of them are in a similar category of 2,000 to 2,500 at max, a little bit under 3,000 at that level. So Abu Huraira is head and shoulders above the rest of them. So we can see this attack on Abu Huraira, why it takes place. Now, in the Mustad Imam Ahmad, which is now the largest book after the Mustad of Baqi ibn Makhlad, Abu Huraira has around 3,800 a hadith in the Muslim Imam Ahmad. 3,800 a hadith. So, definitely the largest number of a hadith narrated by any uh, Sahabi. And one of the things that uh, that is the, the cause for Abu Huraira's frequency of hadith 
is also the fact, as we said, that he lived for a long life and that he by and large dedicated his life to knowledge. Now, what did he do in the time of the Sahaba? Did he not have any political office? It is mentioned that he did participate in a few ghazwas, not too many. And of those ghazawat, he participated in the uh, ghazwas against the, uh, the murtad in the reign of Abu Bakr. And also, Umar ibn al-Khattab appointed him to be the governor of Bahrain, which is basically the highest level of the whole province, the governor of Bahrain, probably because the Prophet had sent him there for that period of time. So then Umar ibn al-Khattab basically then said, okay, you get that province. So he went there for a period of time, and he was the governor of the entire province. And when he returned... He had 10,000 dinars more than when he left. And Umar ibn al-Khattab being the strict you know, ruler that he was, he questioned Abu Huraira. Where did you get this money from? Where did you get this extra income from? What is the fear? No. Charging for that? No, no. taking favors, bribes, basically mal that is not meant to go to his pocket is getting to his pocket. In other words, subhanAllah, it's such a different time. Politicians getting rich through their politics, that's not allowed. Can you imagine? Like currently, our own Congress here, what is it, 70% are multimillionaires? Like of our own, Right? I mean, it is those people that are in office. They don't represent us, they're on their own. And generally speaking, every one of them, they leave far richer than when they came in. And that is enough of a sign to say something is wrong here. Umar ibn al-Khattab, there's warning bells going off. Where would you get this money from? I sent you to be their leader, not to get their money. Are you taking bribes? Are you cutting something off? What is cutting some of the percentage off for your wealth? What is going on? And so Abu Huraira became irritated, said, no, this is my personal tijara of my own time that I'm allowed to, buying and selling, and this is my own, this is my livelihood, and it's nothing to do with the state. So Abu Huray, uh, Umar ibn Khattab sent investigations to find out where did that 10,000 come from? SubhanAllah, what was that time and what is you know, our time now where our big guy refuses to even show his tax for 20 years? Even if he were to, we know what's happening. So, I mean, it's just crazy. So, uh, Abu Huraira said, all of this is my money. I, this is my halal risk from my personal, you know, uh, service. I mean, not service, my personal tijara, yani buying and selling. So, Umar investigated and it was verified that Abu Huraira earned his money from his own time with his own tijara. So then, Umar was happy and said, okay, now you go for round two and you're the governor again. And Abu Huraira said, no, that's it. Khalas. I'm not going to be the governor. I'm not interested in politics. I want to stay in Medina and teach. He gave up politics for professorship. He didn't want to teach. I mean, he didn't want the governors. He wanted to teach. So Umar ibn Khattab allowed him to now become the permanent professor, if you like, you know, literally the chair, professorial chair, if you like, you know, in the haram of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the time of Umar until his death. That is what Abu Huraira did. Is it any miracle then, any strangeness that he has so many ahadith? He became the primary narrator in Medina. That's another key point here. He didn't go to Kufa, Baghdad, Basra. Well, there was no Baghdad. He didn't go to those faraway lands. He stayed in the center of learning until he died. And for the next 30 years, all he did was teach hadith. And of course, at this stage now, he has his business, he has his side income. But now what he is doing, he is teaching the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he, uh, in the time of Uthman radiallahu anh as well, uh, he was of the defenders of Uthman and he physically protected Uthman when he was surrounded. And during the time of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali radiallahu an Abu Huraira was one of the few people who was allowed to give fatwas in Medina. So there was a category of Sahaba. You could go to them for fatwa. Not every Sahabi would give fatwa. 
back then you had to basically the, there was permission given these are the people that fatwa is given from the foremost among them was eventually Ibn Abbas as you know Ibn Umar as you know of them was Abu Huraira so Abu Huraira was allowed to basically give verdicts to the uh, people and along with his teaching he was also basically a mufti and he, we have fatawa about his, uh, his knowledge of fiqh as well uh, Abu Huraira we don't know much about his personal life we do know that eventually he got married somewhere along the way after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. We know only three or four of the children that he had. It doesn't appear that he had a large family. Uh, of his children is Muharrir and of his children is Bilal, Bilal ibn Abi Huraira. And he also had a daughter who was the wife of Muhammad ibn Sirin. So his most famous student is his son-in-law. His most famous student is his son-in-law. And in those days, it was actually very common that the teacher uh, would give his daughters to his best student because he trusted them, he knew them. There are many stories of the past where famous ulama, actually their main student uh, is always their son-in-law generally. And that is not a coincidence in that the main student would then be, the trust was there. And so the sheikh would then uh, marry his daughter. So Abu Huraira married his daughter to uh, Muhammad ibn Sirin. And Muhammad ibn Sirin is considered to be one of the most. Now, who is the most famous student of Abu Huraira? There is no one category because there's so many of them who are famous and well-known, but definitely Ibn Sirin is considered to be one of the most uh, important students of Abu Huraira. Also, we know there's only one reference of Abu Huraira's mother, and it is a very famous story, and it is a story that is very moving as well. And this story seems to indicate that later on in life, Abu Huraira might have had a house that he could go to away from the Sufa. But he still stayed voluntarily in the Sufa. But he might have had a house in Medina in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. This narration is interesting because the story begins and Abu Huraira's mother is a mushrika, a pagan. So what is she doing in Medina? And we don't have any of these details. As with most of these stories, just cryptic references. So let me tell you the story. And this is from the Muslim of Muhammad. Instead of bringing the whole book, I just photocopied it. Uh, it's uh, one of the ahadith of Abu Huraira. That <coughs> Abu Huraira said to his student Abu Kathir. That Abu Huraira was telling his student that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed the believers. Whoever hears about me. Or whoever sees me shall love me. His student said, and how do you know this, O Abu Huraira? So Abu Huraira said, let me tell you. My mother was a mushrika. And I would call her to Islam, but she would refuse to accept Islam. One day I gave her da'wah, and she said something about the Prophet wasallam that really hurt me. So I came to the Prophet Sallallahu crying and I said, O Messenger of Allah, I was inviting my mother to Islam and she continued to refuse but today she said something about you that really hurt me. So please make dua to Allah that he guides Ummi Abi Huraira. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allahumma ahdi Umma Abi Huraira. Allahumma ahdi umma abi huraira. Allahumma ahdi umma abi huraira. Ihdi. Uh, that of course means guide the mother of Abu Huraira. So I rushed back, happy, going to tell my mother the good news that the Prophet made dua for her. And when I got to the door, I found it shut. And I heard water trickling and splashing behind. And when she heard my footsteps, she said, stay where you are, O Abu Huraira. Don't come in. In those days, they didn't have a private bathroom. In those days, it's just one room. It's a very primitive house back then. And so there's no privacy the way that we have privacy in our times. Stay where you are, O Abu Huraira. So I waited. And then she opened the door for me. And she had worn her, her uh, garments and her khimar, meaning she had dressed up. Okay? She had dressed up in a way that as if she's going out or something. And she said to me, Inni ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. 
So she accepted Islam immediately when Abu Huraira comes back. So I went back running to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam crying out of happiness just as I had run to him before crying out of sadness. SubhanAllah. This is Abu Huraira saying. Now the same journey and I'm also crying like I was crying. But this time I'm crying out of happiness and half an hour ago I was crying out of sadness. And I said, Ya Rasulallah, I give you glad tidings that Allah has answered your dua and Ummi Abi Huraira has accepted Islam. And I said, Ya Rasulallah, make dua that me and my mother become beloved to Allah's ibad. That Allah's servants love me and my mother. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allahumma habib ubaydaka hadha wa ummahu ila ibadika al-mu'minina wa habibhu ilayhima that, O oh Allah, cause your servants to love Abu Huraira and his mother and cause the two of them to love your believers as well. And so he said to his student, that is why no mu'min hears about me except that he loves me. And this is an interesting fact that it's very clear it is true. The average Muslim only knows a few names of the Sahaba and that's it. And of those names is a name of somebody who converted towards the very end and only spent three years with the Prophet ﷺ. And that's Abu Hurairah. It's a very interesting tidbit here that Allah Azza wa Jal puts that love of a Sahabi who is not of the ten Ashara Mubashara. In fact, the average Muslim cannot name the Ashara Mubashara. He is not of the earliest converts who sacrificed with the Quraysh, against the Quraysh. And yet, the name of Abu Huraira is of the most famous names beloved to the Muslims because of this dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of the honors of Abu Huraira that again indicate his high status is that when the mothers of the believers passed away, they nominated him to lead their salah. Aisha radiallahu anha, Abu Huraira led her janazah. Think about that. Not the governor, because in those days, generally, the governors would lead the janazahs of the people, the people in charge. In those days, politics and religion were the same thing. So the governor in charge would give the khutbah, would lead the salah, what not. But in special occasions, they would bring a person of honor. So when Aisha radiallahu anha passed away, in the 58th year of the hijrah, Abu Huraira was told to lead the salah. Next year, Umm Salama, of the last of our mothers to pass away, died, and Abu Hurairah led her salah as well. And then a few months after that, Abu Hurairah passed away. And uh, Ibn Umar and Abu Sa'id al-Khudri were the only major two sahaba left, and they were the ones who then took charge of that. So the fact that Abu Hurairah led the salah for our mothers, again, it indicates his seniority in rank, even though at that time there weren't too many alive, but Ibn Umar was alive at that time. And Jabir ibn Abdullah was alive. And Anas ibn Malik was alive. And Abu Sa'id al-Khudri was alive. These are some of the Sahaba alive at that time. But Abu Huraira was the senior most amongst them at that stage. And so he's the one who led the salah for our mothers. So uh, to summarize some points and then criticisms that they have. And then some hadith uh, about his blessings. Not about him. Not from him narrated. But about his blessings. To summarize. Why did Abu Huraira narrate so many hadith? Number one. His closeness to the Prophet ﷺ for three years and the fact that it was the only reason that he was with him at great personal cost, morning to evening, sleeping in the masjid, giving up everything to basically be with the Prophet ﷺ for three years, three and a half years. Number two, that he lived a long life that he dedicated to narrating a hadith. He passed away most likely in the early part of the 60th Hijrah. Many books say the 59th Hijrah, hijrah but, but uh, when you do a little bit of research and tahqiq, it looks like he passed away in the very earliest days of the 60th year of the Hijrah. Now, 60 Hijrah, that is a very late date. Around 50 years after the death of the Prophet wasallam, So that is a massive amount of time. 50 years have gone. And he is essentially constantly narrating a hadith. As well, he stayed in Medina. Unlike Ibn Mas'ud who went to Kufa. Unlike other Sahaba who went to other places. Abu Huraira remained in Medina. And he converted his... Basically, he spent his days becoming 
of the first universities, if you like, or the primary university of hadith, if you like, in the city of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And of course, of the most important reasons is the special dua that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave for Abu Hurairah. This dua is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, and it is mentioned in many books of hadith that once Abu Hurairah complained, "Ya Rasulullah, I forget your hadith. So make dua that Allah allows me to memorize your hadith." So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. Ibsut Rida'ak, put your garment in front of me. So he took his upper garment off and put it in front of him. So the Prophet made dua for him. And the Prophet said that, O oh Allah, cause him to memorize my hadith. Uh, and so he gathered that, uh, that, uh, that uh, upper garment up and put it back. And Abu Huraira said, from that day on, I never forgot a single hadith. Now, this special dua, I don't know of any other Sahabi that asked for this specific dua. O Rasulullah, allow me to memorize your hadith. That specific dua, I don't know of any other Sahabi. And so Abu Huraira was the one who asked for that dua and he therefore got that dua as well. And therefore, those who attack Abu Huraira, the goal is not Abu Huraira, the goal is the sunnah itself. The goal is the sunnah itself, and that is why we already said from the beginning, you had the people who killed Uthman, they were the ones who began those evil rumors. Anything before that is just innocent talk that was explained, as I said. And that's amongst the sahaba, they have the right to question one another at that level, and they were all satisfied. No sahabi ever accused another sahabi of lying. That is simply impossible, and I'm going to quote you something again that shows this as well. Uh, but throughout history, groups have tried to dismantle or criticize Abu Huraira. The Mu'tazila were very harsh as well against Abu Huraira, and we also had in recent times as well uh, a, a renewed attack on Abu Huraira back in the 19... Uh, late 1950s, an Egyptian, uh, you know, modernist or progressive, you know, the, the this trend of modernism, it has kept on coming in and out. And maybe one day I'll give a class on modernism. It's a very interesting topic in and of itself. Um, and I have critiqued the progressive movement many times. I, I, I am a very vocal critic of the progressives. And I find the progressives to be intellectually shallow because they keep on absorbing the values of their times and projecting them onto the Qur'an and Sunnah, not realizing that the values of their times are not the end-all and be-all. They're not realizing that values keep on changing, and they're just so shallow to always presume that whatever is politically correct is going to be what is actually correct. Values change. Morality of the people keeps on coming up and down, and anybody who studies history knows this. We don't take our values from what is the majority position, but progressives always think that that is what needs to be done. So back in the 50s, uh, and this is coming from Muhammad Muhammad Abdu's school back in the uh, in Egypt and whatnot. Uh, one of the students of Muhammad Abdu, his name was Mahmoud Abu Raya. He wrote a very demeaning, derogatory book about Abu Huraira, and he called it Abu Huraira Sheikh Al Mudira. That Abu Huraira, the Sheikh of Mudira, and Mudira is basically uh, a, a dish, uh, a food. It's a food that the Arabs would eat. Because he found a narration, maybe it's true, it doesn't really matter, where it said that Abu Huraira liked to eat this dish. And so what? We all have our favorite dishes. The Prophet had a favorite dish, he would like the leg of lamb. So what if it is true? But just to make fun of him, Abu Huraira, the Shaykh of you know, this dish. That's the title of the book, by the way. Okay, look at how derogatory. And the entire book was basically uh, an attempt to discredit Abu Huraira as a person who uh, was... He didn't care about narrating authentic hadith. He accused him of taking from the Jewish Christian sources. I mean, basically a bunch of stuff like this. Now, this book caused a huge crisis in the Arab and Muslim world at the time. And many famous ulama of the 60s uh, refuted it. And subhanAllah, out of evil, sometimes much good comes. And this book was a huge benefit to revive the sciences of hadith. Because in order to refute the book... Scholars had to go and, you know, basically, because what he did was, he took half narrations here and there, standard. He went back to these sources and he just cut and pasted, and he basically presented a caricature. 
of Abu Huraira that is not authentic. In order to refute, people had to go back and do you know, their research. And so uh, a number of very famous, uh, very famous uh, scholars uh, refuted uh, this, this book. Now, just to give you some examples, and by the way, the, much of the writings of Mahmoud Abu Raya, they were absorbed by Western, Western modernists and liberals as well. And in particular, one of the leaders of the uh, feminist Islamic, the Muslim feminist movement, Fatima Mirnisi, uh, who was uh, probably the first intellectual, and she is intellectual, I'm not going to deny that. She knows her stuff. I mean, that's the, the, being intellectual doesn't mean you're always right. It means like she knows her stuff. Uh, Fatima Munisi, and she passed away two years ago, and she died as a Muslim. So we ask Allah, forgive her, and, and maybe she was, inshallah, and her niyyah was between her and Allah. But she is essentially the founder of modern Islamic feminism, in the Western world, Islamic feminism has Eastern equivalents. Uh, she was a Moroccan lady, uh, eventually becomes a professor at, uh, at Harvard, and uh, she has written a book. Uh, the earliest one goes back to 1970, 71. What is it called? The Veil and the Male Elite, or something like this. You can look it up it's on Amazon, you can find it. She has an entire section dedicated to Abu Huraira. See, you cannot be a progressive or a feminist or an LGBT or anything of that nature without rejecting hadith. You have to reject hadith because it's hadith that keeps you in check. If you reject hadith, the Quran becomes easier for you to manage. It's easier for you to manage. You can twist and distort and whatnot. And that is why that trend of Islam is so vicious in its attack on hadith. Because then, and that's why we call ourselves Ahl Sunnah. What is the Sunnah here? It's Hadith. That's the term we have, it's Ahl Sunnah. That's where the orthodoxy comes from. If you stick to the Sunnah, you really will not go too far. There's a spectrum, and inshallah, within the spectrum, it's all fine and good. Once you reject the Sunnah, then the sky is the limit, and you can twist and turn and do whatever you want. So she has an entire section dedicated to. Uh, saying really nasty things about Abu Huraira. I mean, she literally calls him a misogynist, literally. And she calls Abu Huraira a female hater, misogynist. And that's why he fabricated all of these hadith about women. Don't blame it on the process. He's the one who did it. Right? You see the tactic here, right? Like, discredit him. And by discrediting him, then all of these hadith that I don't like, so that, because see, here's the conundrum. I'm going into my tangent here, but here's the conundrum. How can you claim Muhammad Rasulullah and then not follow his sunnah? You have to get a tactic, right? How can you claim this and then not follow his traditions? So you have a number of tactics. And the most obvious one is to discredit the preservation of hadith, not hadith itself. You understand the difference, right? To discredit the authenticity of the hadith. Because most Muslims don't have any clue how the hadith were compiled. It's a complicated science. So just dismiss it with the flick of a wrist and say, Oh, Bukhari lived 250 years after. End of story. And that again shows their shallow uh, nature. And the point is though, if you don't know any better and you read this book, there are interesting things that she brings that will cause you to doubt. And of them, for example, is the famous hadith of Sahih Bukhari that... Ibn Umar narrated a hadith in front of Abu Huraira, and Ibn Umar said that the Prophet forbade us to own any dogs. We should not own a dog. Abu Huraira said, but he made an exception. And of the exceptions is the dog of agriculture and sheep and like that. Okay? So Ibn Umar said, yes, you are the owner of farms and not me. This hadith is in basically Bukhari. It's a Bukhari hadith. Okay. Now, what does this mean? Well, historically, how have people understood this is very simple. That once Abu Huraira now becomes a businessman, now he is basically this is this this interaction is taking place obviously way afterwards, you know, 40, 50 hijrah, something like this, way afterwards. And at that time Abu Huraira owns lands, he's in he has this and that. So Ibn Umar said, Yes. You, you, you would know that extra addition because you needed it. I didn't need it. Okay? And of course, Mahmoud Abu Raya and then after her Fatima Ibn Nisi, they flip it 180. And they say what? 
He fabricated it and added it for his own benefit. Complete 180. The hadith is very clear in that Abu Huraira said that, oh, but the Prophet made an exception. And he said, the kalb of the farm is allowed. Right? And Ibn Umar said, naam, anta sahibu zar. Yes, you are the owner of farms. And everyone in Islamic history has understood this to mean Ibn Umar saying, oh yes, you're right. I didn't really think about that exception because I don't want to have any dogs and no need to me. But you, because you, especially you're a farmer, you would remember that. I would not remember it. Okay? But Fatima Mirsi comes along and says, ah, so even Ibn Umar is accusing Abu Huraira of lying. No, not at all. Not at all. And other things as well. Uh, can you believe, and I'm not exaggerating, this is exactly in her writings. And again, may Allah forgive her, but... Sometimes you just have very little sympathy for these people, even though she passed away, I shouldn't say too much. May Allah forgive her. I keep on saying that. She is a uh, Muslim and, and she died in the state of Islam. But what she wrote is just, just downright wrong, as simple as that. And ca can you believe in her book, uh, you know, uh, the male elite and uh, the, uh, the veil in the male elite? She actually says that Abu Huraira is a misogynist and he quotes many evidences for this. And of the evidences is Abu Huraira narrated a hadith that the woman who tortured her cat is going to go to Jahannam. And this shows that he hated women. You guys following this logic? I can't follow the logic. I can tell you that she said that. Doesn't make any sense to me. Okay? Because he has, you know the famous hadith of the lady who tortured the cat? And didn't allow it to go outside. And so she goes to Jahannam. So she is trying to find evidence that Abu Huraira hated women. And so she finds this one and she goes, this shows as well that he hated women. And again, it's so easy to refute because pretty much every hadith she doesn't like narrated by Abu Huraira, you will find it by other companions as well. Just a little bit of research will throw this out the window. It's not just only Abu Huraira coming with these types of, of things. And of course, I mean, the whole issue of, you know, progressiveness and LGBT and feminism. I mean, again, as you know, my stance on this, I mean, to me, all of these trends are stepping stones to rejecting Islam. Because once you do the research and you find out that really Islam doesn't live up to those values, there is no other alternative other than to reject Islam. And that is why many people who leave the faith, they actually go through these extreme trends. Because you cannot reconcile Islam with many modern trends. You just can't. And you're going to have to critically decide which version of reality do you prefer. The Quran and Sunnah or certain modern issues that you've considered to be palatable and politically correct. And you can... At a, at a very basic, ignorant level, you can try to say, oh, Islam teaches this and Islam teaches that. And if you don't know any better, you'll live your life like that. But the minute you scratch the surface, the minute you go deeper, you realize you really cannot reconcile. You just can't. And so you end up essentially going one of two ways. Anyway, I'm going into too much detail. Maybe one day. I want to give some lectures about this. Definitely very something very, it's a, it's a very modern problem and yet it's old. It's not the first time it's happened. But it's the first time it's happened over these issues, okay? It's not the first time it's happened that certain trends don't mix with Islam. But it's the first time that those trends are the trends we are all aware of. You know, gender, gender equality, the nature of gender, you know, the transgender issues as well, LGBT issues, feminism as well, humanism, secularism, the discourse on modern human rights. You know, again, all of this is something we need to be very frank about. And if you listen to my, uh, you know, lectures in this, you see we have to find a, 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 anyway, I'm going into a whole different tangent. I didn't prepare for that. Someday, inshallah, we'll do that. Back to my point. To criticize Abu Huraira is a criticism of hadith and a criticism of hadith is a criticism of the Prophet it's that simple anyone who wants to criticize this sahabi know that deep down inside the ultimate result is going to be a criticism of the Prophet himself and by the way this book of Mahmoud Abu Raya uh, it actually resulted in uh, my own sheikh that I told you about so many times uh, Sheikh Muhammad Diya Ar-Rahman Al-A'zami uh, the Hindu convert I told you about so many times uh, His master's dissertation in Umm al-Qura University Was called Abu Huraira 
in light of his narrations and their supporting chains, and it was a refutation of this Mahmoud Abu Rayya, uh, and uh, it is, you will find it online, the entire dissertation, and many other dissertations written to defend Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala an. So inshallah, to conclude very quickly, this is Jami' Tirmidhi, one of the most authentic uh, six books of Hadith al Jami' Tirmidhi, and this is volume four, volume five, and in volume five, he has Kitab al Manaqib, the chapter of the blessings of the companions. And chapter 47, he has Babu Manaqib in Abi Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an, the chapter of the blessings of Abu Huraira. So Imam al Tirmidhi, the famous muhaddith in his Sahih or his Jami' al Tirmidhi, he has an entire chapter about the blessings of Abu Huraira. We'll quickly go over those uh, blessings. So uh, Abu Hurairah narrated that one day I came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I spread my thobe in front of him and he then gathered my thobe and he put it on my heart and after that I never forgot any hadith since that day. So this is a summarized version of the longer one in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari. The hadith then, another one which is by a different chain. I said, O Messenger of Allah, sometimes I hear something from you and I don't memorize it. So he said, spread your garment. So I spread my garment and then he narrated the previous hadith. And then he said, I never forgot any hadith after he did that. So this is a special dua that the Prophet Sallallahu asked Abu Huraira to spread his garment. Then he himself picked up the garment, put it on the heart of Abu Huraira. And after that, Abu Huraira never forgot anything afterwards. Ibn Umar said to Abu Huraira, O Abu Huraira, you were the one who stuck with the Prophet more than all of us. And you were the one who memorized his hadith more than all of us. This is a testimony from number two in that list of the most Sahaba, or number three, depending on how you count them, because it's Abu Huraira, Aisha ibn Umar. They're all in the same camp, if you like that. Aisha and ibn Umar, and basically Anas and all of them, they're kind of sort of in the same category there. Uh, Abu Sa'id al Khudri, Jabir ibn Abdullah, they're all three, four, five, six, like that. So Ibn Umar is saying, you were the one who memorized more, and you were the one who stayed with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa more than us. Malik ibn Abi Amr said that I saw a man go to Talha ibn Ubaidillah, one of the ten, Talha. Talha, one of the ten. And he said that, O oh, Talha, do you see this Yemeni character, meaning Abu Huraira? Is he more knowledgeable than the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam than you? Because we hear from him what we don't hear from you. Very explicit narration. One of the ten promised Jannah and a tabi'i comes up and says, what's going on? This Yemeni guy, not in a very positive way, al Yemaniyu, this Yemeni character here, of course Yemeni here means, of course, Abu Huraira, because he's from Yemen, those. As well. Is he more knowledgeable or what? Because we hear from him what we do not hear from you. Or do you think that he is saying things the Prophet never said? Talha ibn Ubaidillah said, as for him having heard from the Prophet ﷺ what we did not hear, I have no doubt that he heard what we did not hear. And that is because he was a poor person who had nothing and he was dayfu Rasulillah. He was the guest of the Prophet ﷺ. Yaduhu ma'ayadihi. His hand was in his hand. This is Talha saying, his hand was in his hand. And we were people of houses and people of money. And we would come to the Prophet ﷺ in the morning and maybe in the evening. We would come when we could come. Just like those of you who are working full time. If you wanted to study, when would you come? A little bit in the morning, a little bit in the evening, that's it. We would come morning and evening. So I have no doubt that he heard what we did not hear. And... No one has any khair in his heart and would lie about the Prophet ﷺ. Meaning, you ask me two things. Do you think he heard more than we did? Do you think he's a liar? Talha said, number one, I have no doubt he heard more than we did. And number two, anybody with any iman could never lie about the Prophet ﷺ. Okay? So Talha is testifying to Abu Huraira's uh, character. Uh, 
Okay, of them as well, this hadith over here, uh, I'm not going to go all them. Abu Ali narrated that I came to Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira said to me, I came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with some dates. And I said, O Messenger of Allah, make dua that Allah blesses me with these dates. So the Prophet took the dates and put them in his hand. And he made dua for barakah. Then he said, take these dates and put them in your bag or in your sack. And every time you want to take something, then take it from the sack. And do not pour the dates out from the sack. So Abu Huraira said, I would carry that sack for a long period of time. Every time I would get hungry, I would eat from it. And that sack would never leave my body. In fact, I tied it to my belt. Until finally, on the day that Uthman was killed, on that day, someone cut my, my sack of dates off, and I never got it back from there. So that was a blessing that he was poor, he was hungry. So the Prophet said, keep on eating the dates. So every time he would put his hand in, there would be dates there, and the, don't pull the sack out and uh, do that. Um, and the final hadith that uh, we're going to do, uh, oh, he has over here as well, why are you called Abu Huraira? Somebody else asked him. And he said that uh, I would have a small cat, uh, a little kitten, and I would uh, put it uh, to sleep next to me at night. And when uh, it was daytime, I would go and play with it. And so because of that, they called me Abu Huraira. So this is, we know, we already mentioned this, that not only they, but the Prophet himself called him Abu Huraira. And the final hadith in this chapter Abu Huraira said, No one narrates more hadith from the Prophet than me except for Abdullah ibn Amr because he would write and I would not write my hadith. Now, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al As, not Ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al As is also one of the, I forgot to mention, I should have mentioned him as name. Ibn Umar and Ibn Amr. These are, and Aisha and Jabir and Anas, these are of the top names. And Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As is also in that list. And Abu Huraira felt that Abdullah ibn Amr narrated more hadith than him. In reality, Abu Huraira narrated more hadith than Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As. But Abu Huraira was positively jealous. You're allowed to be positively jealous of one thing. And that is that he said that Ibn Amr had a note. And I didn't write notes. And this is true. Abdullah ibn Amr would have a volume of hadith. And he would write down a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whereas Abu Huraira would memorize. But still, the memory was more than the written word. And Abu Huraira in, ended up narrating more hadith than Abdullah ibn Am ibn al-As. And with that, we conclude the story of Abu Huraira. The most correct position of his name is Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhar ibn Dawsi. And there are over 20 other opinions of his name who passed away. The most correct opinion is the 60th year of the Hijrah. And he is buried in Baqir al Gharqad as well. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless Abu Huraira for all that he has done for his for the Ummah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause the preservation that he did to continue to live on and on in our lives as well. Any quick questions about Abu Huraira before we break for the salah? Yes. Uh, so at that time, like, there were not much uh, memorizers of the Quran. Yeah. So That's a very good question. You have to realize in early, early, early Islam, there was a genuine fear of the Quran being forgotten. And so that is why even we have the Prophet himself saying, and the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, don't write anything from me except the Quran. Whoever writes anything other than the Quran, erase it. And this hadith, has been used by those who reject hadith to say, look, even the process of saying don't write anything. But what they forget is Sahih Muslim has this. And the very next narration is he is mentioning various narrations that you can write hadith. And the conciliation between these two is very easy. And that is in early Islam, the Muslims were forbidden from writing hadith, only memorizing and narrating them. Because Muslims were just learning to read. And reading was almost like a sacred thing at that early stage. Okay, 
So at that early stage, let everybody read the Quran, concentrate on the Quran. Towards the end of the life of the Prophet the door was open for hadith as well. And we know this because there are so many, including Ibn uh, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Aas, the Prophet knew that he would write hadith. And Ali ibn Abi Talib, he would write hadith as well. And so many other uh, explicit narrations where the Prophet ﷺ, uh, wrote hadith and in fact he commanded people to write, wrote meaning he, he dictated I should say, and he commanded others to send his hadith. So at that early stage, there was a genuine fear and that's why Umar himself in the early part of his Khilafah said no hadith halaqas, let's concentrate on the Quran. And the hadith was simply meant to be practiced, not to have a special dars of hadith. Okay, So people should memorize that. Why did Abu Huraira radiallahu an already understand that? One could argue that this was really his role in the ummah, the preserver of hadith. That is the title given to him. That he understood that a time will come when these hadith are needed just as much as the Quran are needed. And that is why he started teaching hadith even when technically the ban had not been lifted. And that's why Umar called him back and said, do you remember that day we were there? And Abu Huraira said, I know exactly what you call me. And then after that, Abu Huraira was allowed to teach. So we, we would say that Allah blessed Abu Huraira to understand that there was a need to preserve hadith just like there was a need to preserve Quran. And that's why he insisted on having the hadith halaqa despite the fact that Umar had wanted to ban that halaqa. Okay, go ahead. Imam Malik, when did Imam Malik die? Many years later. But with Imam Malik, because everything that he did was based on the tradition of Medina, so with most of his reading... Imam Malik has a lot of hadith of Abu Hurairah and Muatta. That's what I was going to say. A lot of hadith. He has a lot of credence to that. Yes, he has a lot of hadith of Abu Hurairah, and between him and Abu Hurairah are two people. So, two people only. No, that's Ibn Umar. Okay, yeah, go ahead. That is a difficult question, and that is a question that uh, I tr tried to look up very quickly today, and it would take me too long for this one halaqa. Uh, the question is unique to Abu Huraira, not more than 200 or so, what I, what I looked up today, but for, to get a more precise number, there are two or three masters and PhD dissertations that I didn't download, and if I were to download them, it'd take me like a few hours to scan through and see. There's two or three specialized dissertations on Abu Huraira and his narrations and whatnot. And uh, that's a very good question. And I confess that I did not go down this tangent. But Abu Huraira's unique narration. So what did he narrate that the other Sahaba did not narrate? That is the subject of some discussion and dissertations. And at the end of the day, the problem comes that this is an ijtihadi topic. Because I don't, you're getting, it's a very deep question, it's a very good question. Many times, two Sahaba are narrating hadith that are vaguely similar, but not exactly. Are you going to consider that to be the same narration or not? If a hadith mentions something about the Dajjal, another Sahabi mentions the same thing and mentions two other things, is that the same narration or is that something else? So how do you define two separate narrations? That's really the, co the point here, okay? A lot of times there's overlap. So no one can be 100% precise because it's a matter of ijtihad. Is this a separate hadith from this one or is it really the same one? Because once you get to do two different Sahaba, Generally speaking, the wordings are going to be very different from one another. Because again, the, the beginnings of the chains go back to the Sahaba. And the Sahaba realized one of the biggest ishkal of hadith is that the hadith is preserved by meaning and not by wording. So hadith, the words are from the Sahaba and the narrators. So if you look at the same hadith in 10, 15, 20 different narrations, you find changes along the isnad because unlike the Quran that is preserved word for word hadith has been preserved by meaning so that's why it's almost impossible to answer that question definitively nonetheless I want to say not more than a few hundred that's what I quickly looked up today final question there was a hand There's no sisters questions today okay bismillah go ahead.
So the question is about weak hadith, do we take them or not? And uh, as usual, there are many madhabs of the ummah about all of these things. The dominant position that has been the historical majority from the beginning of times up until our times, the dominant position and the one that I follow, uh, and the one that Imam al nawi said there is ijma on this position, but in fact there wasn't ijma, there was some minor differences, and in our times those minor differences have become very big. The dominant position is that you categorize hadith into a number of categories. You have authentic, authentic as sahih and hasan, A and B. Then you have weak, da'if, then you have very weak and fabricated. Okay? So you have acceptable, weak, very weak and fabricated. Okay? Acceptable or sahih and hasan. As for the very weak, we ignore them. As for the fabricated, it is haram to narrate them unless you say that it's fabricated. We Fabricated means we can stamp for sure that the Prophet didn't say it. Okay? And the fabricated hadith, by and large, are not found in the six books. By and large. The six books of hadith, by and large, maybe one might say one or two, but in reality, even those, they're very weak. So in the six books, there are really no fabricated hadith per se. The fabricated hadith are found in the obscure books that most people have never heard of. Okay, these are books written in the 4th or 5th century of the Hijra, uh, such as Musnad uh, al-Firdaus al-Daylami, or books that are not books of hadith, they're books of history, for example, or books of, of um, you know, uh, like for example, books written in the 5th or 6th century that dealt with literature, Kitab al-Aghani, for example, of Abu al-Faraj al-Sfahani. These are books, that the books of poetry. And they'll just say, Qala Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they'll just mention it. And there's not going to be any isnad at all. But because it's written in a book in the 5th century, so somebody comes along the 7th century and says, oh, this is narrated. And when it's narrated in the 7th century, 700 years go by and people just spread it. Okay? And there are many famous examples, seek knowledge even if you have to go to China. It's a well-known fabricated hadith. It's not, none of the books of hadith ever mention this. Hubbul watani min al-iman. It's fabricated hadith. The word watan is an invention of later Arabs. It's nothing, you know, loving your country is a part of iman. It's a fabricated hadith. Okay? There was no watan. Uh, in, in the time of the process of Aslan. You know, you know this is fabricated just by the wording of it. So these are all fabricated ahadith, you know them. Now, the category of da'if. Da'if has a very clear understanding, and that is that we're not sure. Did the process of say it, or did he not say it? We're, we're not sure. And the most common reason for da'if, there are 40, 50 reasons. The most common reason is there's a missing link somewhere. Another reason is the person who's in the chain, we don't know anything about him. So for example, I don't, I'm, I'm just making up an example, don't quote me on this. Maybe Abu Huraira had a grandson, maybe. I'm just saying, I'm, actually he didn't, I'm just saying. Just, I shouldn't have made that, but you get my point though. One of the Sahaba's grandsons said, I heard from my father that his father said. Now, what if we don't know anything about the grandson? We need to know who he is. Okay, the Sahaba we trust, but not every single son or grandson, his memory was good. Not every one of them we know for a fact that what he preserved was authentic. So what if he's unknown? We don't know. In that case, it'll be a weak hadith. And a weak hadith means we are not sure. So what do we do with weak hadith? The bottom line, weak hadith, the majority of scholars say, number one, we cannot use them for deriving Islamic law or for deriving Islamic theology. We cannot use them. Fiqh and aqidah cannot be used with da'if hadith because you need to have a higher level of certainty. Okay? Number two, we may use them for historical purposes. Something happened in Badr and it's narrated in a weak hadith. No big deal. Okay? Much of the seerah is da'if, quote-unquote. History. Much of the seerah is da'if, meaning... We just have narrations. Yani the grandson of a Sahabi said, I heard from my grandfather. Or my, it is narrated. And we don't know who the missing link is. No big deal. Ibn Ishaq is full of missing chains. Ibn Ishaq died 150. 150 Hijrah. And a lot of times you'll just say the Prophet and him did. That's a hundred years between him and the Prophet How do we know? We're not 100% certain. But we just assume he's studying from the grandsons of the Sahaba, etc. No big deal, as long as we're not deriving theology and fiqh. Okay? Number three, so history, no big deal at all. And that's why Imam Ahmad said, 
when we narrate about haram and halal, shaddadna, we become strict. And when we narrate the seerah and maghazi, tasahalna, he goes, no big deal, we can narrate. This is Imam Ahmad. When we're narrating haram and halal, strict. And when we narrate seerah and maghazi, okay, no big deal, we don't have to be that strict anymore. Okay. Number three, what if the ahadith are about not haram and halal, and not seerah, but some generic good deed that people do. Here, the majority position is that if it is a generic good deed that is already confirmed in the Quran and Sunnah, but we come with a specific blessing that is not found in the authentic hadith, what do we lose by narrating a da'if hadith? For example, there is a specific hadith about charity and the blessings of charity. It's da'if. And we narrate it. Is there any problem for telling the Muslims to give to the poor? For example, there is a da'if hadith, Yasin Qalb al-Quran. It's da'if. So what? So what if somebody loves Surah Yasin? Is that a problem? If they recite Surah Yasin extra, is that a problem? So what? There is a da'if hadith, slightly weak. There's again, one of the narrators, um, his hiv this week, that whoever memorizes the Quran on judgment day, he will wear a crown and he will give shafa'ah to his parents. Okay? So what? Do we encourage the people and inshallah and Allah's generosity is going to happen inshallah. Is there a problem to encourage the people to memorize the Quran using this hadith? No. Because memorizing the Quran is something that is good anyway. So now we come across a weak hadith and it says do this. Okay, bismillah. No big deal. So the majority position is weak hadith can be used for actions that are already proven in the Quran and Sunnah and it's just an added encouragement. But some say, if you use it in a khutbah, in a dars, you should tell the audience that look, this hadith is not like Bukhari and Muslim. This hadith is grade C. Okay, So know that it is weak. Go ahead and do it. And inshallah, we hope Allah will give you the reward but realize that we're not sure that the Prophet said it. And that's a a good compromising position. Now you also had the stricter side say, oh, da'if hadith, we discard them completely, we should not use them at all. And this is a very minority opinion in medieval and, and early Islam, and it has become very popular in our times uh, because it was the visit of Shaykh al-Albani, and Shaykh al-Albani is the reviver of sciences of hadith in our time. There's no question about that. And because of his status, a lot of people followed this position from him. But in reality, it is a very minority position and it would not have ever come back into mainstream if uh, he had not done this. But that's a legitimate opinion, inshallah. Anyway, to that, with that, inshallah, we conclude. <laughs> تعدد حبات الرمال وأكثرا صلى عليك الله ما غيث هما فوق السهول وبالجبال وبالقرى فوق السهول وبالجبال وبالقرى